For some reason, my wife thought we needed a new mailbox. After explaining to her that ours was fine for the last half decade or so, I could procrastinate no longer. And with the help of the ever-growing shop apprentice, I built this very good mailbox post. I started by picking one of the rocks by the entrance to our driveway as a footing. I also picked up a couple 6x6 cedar posts from a secret local supplier that were air dried down to 10%, which is glorious. In addition, I got a new mailbox and a few other odds and ends. After some measuring and rough layout, I ran the posts through the wide belt sander. These have been rolling around outside in the dirt for a good number of years. Sanding first will prevent nicks in my jointer and planer blades. Let me just mention at the start of this project, good lumber makes all the difference. It's such a pleasure to work with nice materials, and this particular lumber that I found had a high ream density, plus it was nice and dry, so it cut and machined beautifully, which really makes for an enjoyable project. I used the jointer and planer to square up the posts, and I used the mighty bandsaw to bring them down to size. I figure I should build from the ground up. After marking the location of the hole for the threaded rod, I busted out my corded hammer drill and got to drilling. I drilled a hole about six inches deep, cleaned up, and then went to lunch. While eating my sandwich from the sandwich shop that is named after a popular form of underground transportation, I couldn't stop the thinking that six inches, as with my sandwich, was simply not enough. I increased depth to about 10 inches, blasted the hole clear of detritus, and epoxied the half-inch threaded rod in place. I wanted to take a moment to mention my double taper sanding disc. When installed in a table saw, it sands the edge of a workpiece to a finish ready surface and to a perfect 90 degrees. Solid wood, MDF, or plywood all sand equally well. If you'd like more information on how to get one of these for your shop, check the description below or visit MikeFarrington.com. Next up was to drill the hole in the bottom of the post for the other half of the threaded rod. I used my slot mortiser to get the hole started, which worked well enough, but the bit was spinning at about 3,500 RPMs, which is twice as fast as needed. Not a huge deal, but it does reduce the life of the bit. I finished up the hole by hand. I used five minute epoxy, so I was ready to cut down the threaded rod after drilling the bottom of the post. I felt my sawzall was up to the task because it saws most things. Pro tip, put the nut on, then cut, then pull the nut off. This will help clean up the threads from the sawing process. Time to scribe the post to the rock. There isn't much to do in this case, but it still needs to be done. I start off with a chisel because I couldn't remember where I put my angle grinder. At some point, I ended up remembering and made the switch. The key to doing this is to take it slow for one and do several test fits. When doing a test fit, smash the post down onto the rock. This will leave imprints where there's interference. Keep removing material until the fit is good. I like to do two marks to find center rather than trying to mark 2 and 25 one twenty-eighths or whatever the center is. I just mark 2 and 3 sixteenths from each side and the space in between is the center. This hole will allow access to the top or I guess end of the threaded rod and I chisel a small flat spot for the washer to sit in.
with the post now scribed and bolted in place, I can take final measurement for the mailbox height, which in my neck of the woods is supposed to be between 41 and 45 inches. I go for 45 because I'm planning for the rock to sit down into a shallow hole. With the height marked, I can lay out for a giant mortise that will house the arm that the mailbox sits on. I mark the front and the back since I'll be drilling in from both sides. I use my newly restored Powermatic Model 400 hollow chisel mortise for this task. If you'd like to see this tool restored, have a look at my channel. There's an outstanding video documenting that process. I've had several mortisers over the years, all of which I was able to get good enough results with. However, none of them were as fun to use as this one. This is such a nice tool, and I'm lucky to have this one in my shop. I come back with a chisel and slightly undercut the mortise, which will help ease assembly later. Now that I have a giant mortise, I need to mill the corresponding giant tenon. I use the very end of the workpiece as a test bed. This piece is still a little long, so if I overcut, no big deal. As I'm cutting, I'm looking for a fit that's just a little too big. That way I can come back and fine tune the fit with hand tools. Once I get the saw set up just right, I make 9,000 cuts to remove the needed material. Once I'm done with the north and south sides, I move on to the east and west sides. And I use the same 9,000 cut process as before. I leave a little bit of wood on all four sides as a kickstand, I guess you'd call it, so the workpiece doesn't tip into the blade. This makes for a more accurately milled tenon, and I clean off the excess with a chisel and my two horsepower pole saw. final sizing of the tenon is done with a block plane and a paring chisel. If you're a woodworker, you know the sense of accomplishment when a nicely fitted joint comes together. Here's a quick look at the front and the back. Pretty clean if I do say so myself. Next, I mark for and drill an angled mortise that will house what's known as a tusk, maybe better called a wedge. This tusk is what will hold the mortise and tenon together. After removing most of the waste with the hollow chisel mortiser, I chisel the angle by hand. I thought this would be a good time for an excessively artsy shot, or as I like to call it, an EAS. Here I'm marking the angle the tusk needs to be cut at to match its mortise. I use the bandsaw to clear away the waste, then I fit the tusk once again with the mighty block plane. I wanted to add a little zazzle to the tusk, and I think this did the trick. This shot shows how the tusk locks everything in place. Next on the agenda is the knee brace, and I don't want to brag, but I think I am the very first carpenter to use an actual stop block. The idea here is I make a 45 degree cut, then flip the workpiece over and make another cut. That means the point will be centered, which will make cutting the tenons easier. Speaking of tenons, I move over to the table saw to cut said tenons. The saw fence sets the depth of the tenons, the saw blade establishes the thickness, and the miter gauge provides the needed 45 degree angle. 
Pro tip, pick up a set of drafting triangles. They're relatively cheap and I've found them to be very accurate. Perfect for setting up a miter gauge to 45 degrees as well as a host of other little tasks around the shop. Here was a semi-sort of mistake. I wanted to put a shoulder on the bottom edge of the tenon. This would provide a cleaner look, but the little piece left would have been very fragile. I realized this as I'm chiseling right up to that point. The way to do this would be to have a little flat spot and then the shoulder. This would avoid the point, but I didn't want to do that, so I just cut it off and moved on. This is the top edge, or inside edge, I guess you'd call it. Adding a shoulder here was no problem. Once the tenons were cut, I laid out for the corresponding mortises. Back again to the mortiser. Half the mortise needed to be cut to full depth. The other half needed to be angled uh, to 45 degrees. I could have adjusted the angle of the mortiser bed, but that just seemed like too much work. So I just eyeballed it, and then I came back and cleaned it up by hand. I considered adding some store-bought numbers. Maybe that would have looked better. Then I thought that doing a relief carving and then putting some paint would look neat as well and would probably work better with the timber frame look of the project. So that's the direction I went. Quick side note, I made a mock address sign for the video. This isn't my actual address. I wouldn't want my actual address getting out as my millions, oh, did I say millions? I meant billions of female fans would be all over me. I thought it would be cool if the address sign slid into a dovetail slot on the post. Maybe it would look as though a little more thought was put into the project. So I cut the angles on the sign, then I marked the post and began removing the waist. After most of the waist was removed, I angled the blade to 7 degrees in the sliding table saw and cut the two outer edge cuts. At this point, the dovetail dado thing is undersized, so I sneak up on the fit with the trusty block plane. After fitting this sign, it's now time for a bunch of little random tasks. The first of which is to add a few coats of paint to the address sign. Next is to cut a plug for the hole in the back of the column. I do this with my slot mortiser because the chuck on my drill press won't open far enough to accept the plug cutter's 5 8 inch shank. This is not the best way to do this because it spins at about 3500 RPMs and this plug cutter should spin at about 200 RPMs. So I take little bites to keep the cutter as cool as possible. Next up is to drill the holes for the dowels that will hold the mortise and tenons together. I drill straight through the mortise, and then I use the same drill bit to mark where I need to drill on the tenon, if that makes sense. I then slightly offset that to add some tension to the joint to make sure that it stays pulled nice and tight. This is commonly called draw boring. I drill the offset hole in the tenon and move on to making the needed dowels. I use white oak since it does well enough outdoors and it's super duper hard, so it makes a good dowel. I start with half inch square stock. I knock down the corners to make it an octagon. Then I work the ends to make them pretty close to round. One side to fit into my drill chuck and one side to fit into my secret dowel making jig. This jig works like magic, except better. I take any old piece of steel and drill the correct size hole in it. Drilling a hole in steel will create a burr or a sharp little piece around the edge of the hole. 
Leave this in place and face it towards the direction the dowel will be fed. This burr is actually what does the cutting. Now it's just a matter of drilling the octagonal piece of wood through the hole and out the other side pops a really nice dowel. I love this trick. It's so simple and yet works so well. Plus, now it's easy to make any size dowel I may need. The ends of the arm felt a little heavy to my eye, so I wanted to lighten them up a little bit. I used some paper taped on to see what looked good. I kicked around a few ideas, but ended up settling on this design, and I proceeded to make a horrible cut on the bandsaw, leaving quite a bit of cleanup work with the hand plane. For the top of the post, I decided to go with a pyramid shape, which will help shed water. My camera decided to run out of batteries right as I started this process. I also rounded the edges. Again, this will help shed water. Nice straight grain makes for great hand planing. So I cleaned up all the surfaces and eased the edges. I also planed off the excess paint from the address sign. I don't think there's a good long lasting finish for wood that lives outdoors that doesn't require regular refinishing. And I'm just not gonna do that for a mailbox post. Pretty much all outdoor wood sealers are a mix of some oil, some wax, and a thinner. So since I had it laying around, I decided to make my own with boiled linseed oil and paint thinner mixed to a secret ratio. I slopped on a few coats and cleared off any areas where the finish was pooling. This finish will not really offer a ton of protection. That's okay. Cedar ages well outdoors. Over time, it turns a beautiful silvery gray color, actually very close to the color that my beard is turning. Time for assembly. There's something very satisfying about assembling large mortise and tenons. Whacking home the tusk and the dowels really give a solid feel of permanence. My little wimpy tractor was unable to lift this rock, so I called in a favor from my neighbor who has a much larger tractor. He helped me dump the rock in place. From there, I goofed around with the rock until I got it where it needed to be. I'd like to send a shout out to Chris, whose YouTube channel is titled Third Coast Craftsman. I was inspired to build this project based on a similar project that he built. He's a great woodworker and a nice guy to boot, so thank you Chris for the inspiration. Once the threaded rod was nice and plumb, I slide the post on and tighten the nut down tightly for the first time, and I add the plug to the hole. Of course, after tightening the nut down, I give the post the old shake test and it passed with flying colors. Let me just say, this thing is rock solid. See what I did there? Lastly, I screwed the address sign in place with a deck screw. Here is my starting point, and here's where I finished. I love working on our house. I think this project turned out fantastic. It works great, doesn't tip over, and I think it looks pretty nice too. It's always nice to add a little sweat equity and curb appeal to the compound. Thank you for watching, till next time.